Hello everyone, this section of the website will cover economics and trading. I have been engaging in financial markets for four years and trading full time for the past two. I have appreciated roughly $6,500 into the mid six figures in stock equity with what most people would call high frequency trading and I was an early investor and a current holder of Bitcoin. But names like high frequency trading, penny stocks, and day trading are all just titles and semantics. The best investments are simply well-timed trades, and trading patterns of all market caps and price per shares are strikingly similar. I will be detailing my approach to the market as well as posting live trade examples for people to analyze and hopefully learn from. Also, I am a patent holder and a serial entrepreneur that has seen business from all angles. When people hear the words investing or trading, they typically have thoughts of Wolf of Wall Street or flashbacks to the few times they exposed capital in a financial market and it didn't turn out so well. The reality of financial markets are they provide substantial and real potential to make life-changing money and yet so few people have real experience in developing a trading strategy. A good tr trading strategy is straightforward, simple, and founded on well thought out economic principles. After discussing the principles I see as relevant, I will be comparing the principles with real trades. My goal with these videos is to cover all the basics a brand new trader would need to understand market dynamics and be profitable as an independent trader. The goal of these videos is to teach the average retail investor with a small amount of initial trading capital how to understand industry dynamics, discover opportunities in financial markets, and finally to structure trades with lucrative risk reward scenarios for a set risk tolerance. It is often said that you should only risk what you are willing to lose, but to never trade is to risk never getting rich. It just depends on your definition of risk. First, we need to start with what the basics of the economy is, what an industry is, and what a financial market is. An industry consists of consumers and producers of a given product or service. A market is the financial instruments that represent those industries, and the economy is the aggregate of health of both. People who buy stuff are consumers, people who sell stuff are producers. It is taught that an asset's price is determined by supply and demand. Sure. But demand is substantially more influential than supply in determining an asset's price because the environment contains considerably vaster resource stores in comparison to consumption rates and population numbers. If people want a product and there is money to be made, someone will want to produce it. Take diamonds for example. They are a very common resource, but the culture surrounding diamonds determines its fashionableness and garners a higher price tag. More specifically than consumers and producers, an industry is composed of private businesses, public businesses, cash stores, labor, and debt. Most specifically, an industry is composed of debtors and creditors. When you trade, you will be buying and selling equities, which are stocks of specific companies, options contracts on those equities, forex pairs, which are the cash relationships of national currencies, or futures contracts on commodities such as oil and gas. Additionally, you can deal in debt instruments of the economy. I don't personally trade debt products, but the interest rates charged by the Federal Reserve and other lending institutions indicate the confidence and expediency of expected repayments. I heavily recommend and have geared these lectures towards developing an intuition and acumen for as many financial products as possible, because there are many markets but one economy. The more comprehensive your understanding of the big picture, the more trading opportunity you will discover. In addition to an economic understanding, a realistic approach to managing emotions is just as important to your decision-making skills when managing a trade. People who can manage their emotions and stick to simple but flexible guidelines will benefit the most from trading while people who can't will blame the market for their shortcomings and their own decision-making skills. Stock trading, trading requires patience, discipline, and timing more so than highly technical computer models and years in finance or a business executive role. The economic principles you use in your trading strategy should reflect how people, including yourself, actually behave. The presiding explanatory economic model to assess human behavior is widely known as game theory. Although it is not actually a theory for reasons you can listen to in my science lectures, game theory was initiated by a famous mathematician named John von Neumann and widely circulated and propagated with a book called Theory of Games in Economic Behavior which was co-authored by economist Oscar Morgenstern. Since its initial development, the principles of game theory have been applied extensively in economics, mathematics, biology, and psychology. The research and publications of game theoretic papers has led to 11 Nobel Prizes in economics, 
but is it correct? Well, let's have a look. There are numerous extensions and modifications to the core assumptions of the model, but this typical structure is as follows. Game theory assumes that a player can adopt multiple strategies for solving a problem, that there is an availability of predefined outcomes, that the overall outcomes for all players would be zero at the end of the game, that all players in the game are aware of the game's rules as well as outcomes of other players, and that players take rational decisions to increase their profit. The assumptions of game theory capture some essence of human behavior, but falls vastly short of describing the industries we evidently see and experience in real life. Behavior is not always or predominantly rational. Behavior is not always irrational. Subtly, behavior is rather playful. And trading patterns are the direct results of people's spending patterns. We don't have the outcomes of our choices predefined, and the fact that profit exists demonstrates that the global economy is the exact opposite of a zero-sum game. Profit is the result of value creation, and when one person produces products and services of real value, everyone benefits. The seller makes his money, the customer receives a useful product or service, and governments generate taxes. Think about the real-life steps of developing a new idea. An entrepreneur or company creates value by investing the time to think and innovate a product or service. The entrepreneur or company may or may not have taken on debt to launch, and if the industry reacts favorably to the innovation, a company will probably be formed around the initial success. Once the company is widely successful, the founder and investors pays off the debt of the company and become very rich. Then what? Typically, and ever more so in today's day and age, the founder and the company engage in social programs, begin philanthropic efforts, and invest in other entrepreneurs. Undeniably, there is tremendous corporate value to social enterprise. Do businesses want financial returns? Absolutely. Do the vast, vast majority of businesses or business people prioritize monetary returns at all costs? Demonstrably, no. To maximize profits, you must maximize the quality of the lives of other people. So how do the actions of real people affect financial markets and spending patterns of consumers? Simply, it shows people focus on themselves until their basic needs are met, which requires a low to modest income. People then enjoy spending money on convenience items on a modest to high income, and people like to buy luxury items and give back to the community at extreme incomes. But let's consider, let's consider a simple question. What exactly is technology, and why is it so hard to define? Take a moment and pause this video and ask yourself, what is technology? And see if you come up with a convincing, and more importantly, a distinctly correct definition. Pretty difficult, isn't it? Problem solving is all about asking the right questions, so let's try a different one of, the simil of a similar flavor. What was humanity's first technologic innovation? The ability to communicate with language. Turn on the animal channel. All organisms communicate and demonstrate awareness, but which species speaks? We do. Furthermore, consider all the major technologic advancements of human history. We have the developments of stone tools, the developments of metal tools, the ability to use heat through the process of combustion, engines to power locomotives, and the transfer of electricity to produce light. Besides that, what else is there? I highly recommend reading Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond for a fantastic large-scale look at the development of so-called technology over the course of human history. Additionally, I recommend reading Straight Talk on Trade by Danny Roderick to see an industry-wide acknowledgement that people have not figured out how to properly integrate emotion into economic models, and the laws of motion are evidently incomplete without accounting for emotion. In the same way all scientists measure from the same environment, all inventors invent with the same set of resources, the periodic table of elements. There's a common sentiment in entrepreneurship that you'll never invent something new, only improve upon what is there. I think this sentiment is evidently true, inherent to how an industry develops in the first place. Industries develop over longer periods of time than any one person really pioneers regardless of the hoopla awards people give one another to make themselves feel good. When an inventor gets the motivation to innovate, the key is to, to a really good business is really good industry research. Without the motivation to innovate, you'll never get new inventions. Without demand for those inventions, your product or company can't even begin, let alone last for a substantial period of time. The consumers establish demands for things they need or want, and if you discovered something truly novel, there would be no demand at all. You can't want what you don't know exists. Technology solves problems, and where do problems that need to be solved come from in the first place? The desire and demand for efficiency in an industry. 
efficiency is profitability. Furthermore, all technology over the large-scale evolution of human history increases the efficiency of communication. Communication is the ability to transfer meaningful information and subsequently a technology is an application of knowledge that increases the efficiency of information transfer. All technology is innovative. And innovation comes from the ability to think, not from the desire for profit. If language was the first innovation of humanity, what problem did it solve, you ask? The ability to communicate our emotions to one another. That's what music is. That's what art is. What did a bunch of apes with cell phones learn? We're all just like each other. Shocker. Businesses generate value propositions from innovation. You literally must build on what came before you. Anyone worth two seconds of your time in business knows money is made by executing on the inefficiency in an industry, not by having a breakthrough idea, which directly leads me to the notion of the efficient market hypothesis. The efficient market hypothesis states that all asset prices reflect all current available information to investors. The efficient market hypothesis is evidently and unequivocally false. It takes time for people to digest information. People don't accurately interpret information with a high consistency. There are numerous, numerous players in the financial markets. The overall capital size of the global economy and the slowness of corporate trading all directly contradict what you would expect if the efficient market hypothesis was remotely valid. Since people execute trades and our devices allow for seemingly instantaneous communication, what is the relationship of so-called technology in the attention span of people? People have access to information profoundly faster than ever before, but behavioral tendencies dictated by emotion and decision-making skills change much, much slower. Evidently, biological evolution requires hundreds of millions of years, technological evolution only thousands. Furthermore, with the advent of online trading desks and brokers, the diversity of market players has grown from a specialty practice to commonplace. According to the Federal Reserve Survey in 2013, it is estimated that roughly half of all U.S. households participate in the stock market. In addition to retail accounts, you have institutions which pool money and invest collectively. Like any large organization and corporation, institutional investors much approve trades through layers of managers and executives. Because of the sheer number of market players and capitalization of the overall economy, any account size is dilutive in comparison to the overall economy. The Forex market exchanges $4 trillion a day, while the futures market and stock market exchange hundreds of billions a day. No one has that big of an account in comparison. I say this to emphasize this is where your serious opportunity lies as a retail investor. There is real attainable opportunity because of the inherent and profound inefficiencies of business operation in the short and medium term. It is not me, just me saying this. It is everyone who has a clue in the financial sector. Warren Buffett and Jamie Dimon recently called for the end of financial projections for the exact reason that you do not know what the future holds. The quote-unquote best technical indicators for charts or financial models for fundamentals are still hideously inadequate to predict the future of a company, let alone a market, let alone an industry, let alone the economy. It's not that a better model is needed either. You just can't know the future. Shocker again. Games are competitive, but is life. My guess is you said yes, but reality doesn't give a shit what you think, and the answer is actually no. Look around you. We are the only species that speaks, and the only independent species that doesn't have to risk our lives to eat. We complain when we encounter five seconds of inconvenience. That is the exact opposite of competition. The ability to communicate sure killed the biological necessity of competition, and for the better. Bill and Melinda Gates and Mark Zuckerboink demonstrate this entire life cycle of working for yourself and then helping others when you can by pledging to give away 99% of their wealth within their lifetimes. Communication killed competition because people all share the same emotions. When people are happy and healthy, the economy does well. When the economy does well, we all win. The next video in this series will cover the nitty gritty of trading, setting up your account, getting used to your software, setting up scans, building a watch list, technical indicators, charts, earnings reports, press releases, and the fun part of actually executing trades. Thanks for watching.